Willkommen. Uh, my name is Steve Harris, and uh, I have the uh, pleasure of uh, introducing the conference and uh, introducing Kosuke to you and uh, welcoming you to, uh, to the Jenkins User Conference in Europe. Uh, this is um, actually the second leg of the Jenkins World Tour this year. Uh, it's just incredible, I think, how this uh, community has grown. It's, it's so fantastic to stand in front there and see all the energy and the people uh, here to uh, participate and meet one another and so on. Um, last week, we did an event uh, that was like this in Boston. We had... Uh, 450 attendees uh, for it, and uh, it was just terrific. So, and then we'll be moving uh, to do it in another two or three weeks in Israel. And uh, the signups for that are still underway, and so it's come a long way since we did the first uh, Jenkins User Conference in San Francisco uh, almost three years ago. Now there were a couple hundred people, and uh, it's just really terrific. So here we are. Everybody's made it here. Uh, so just to uh, get you oriented, uh, there will be two tracks. The first track will take place here in this auditorium. The second track is around the corner uh, in um, Hall 6. So it's a, it's a nice amphitheater sort of setting and so on. And then the uh, sponsors you've already seen are um, out front. So. So we have the two tracks running in the, uh, each of the halls. They're going to go parallel. You can check and, and uh, attend the sessions that, that you'd like. Uh, we have a lunch uh, scheduled uh, around noon. And then uh, we have a section marked off in mid-afternoon where there will be refreshments out front and so on and give you some time to uh, visit with the conference sponsors uh, for this event. And speaking of the sponsors, so the, the, one of the reasons that this uh, conference is, is so cheap uh, is because of the sponsors of it um, and the community sponsors who've helped uh, generate interest in it and, and so on. Um, so, but uh, we definitely depend on the sponsorship of these companies and so on to, to help fund this event and keep the cost under control. So I hope... I hope you will uh, do your part by visiting them, seeing what they can help you out with, hearing what they do, and so on, and seeing if uh, their, uh, uh, their, their offerings are consistent with the kinds of things that you're interested in pursuing. Uh, we also have, uh, as part of the conference, if you'll go into your materials, you should uh, find a, a trivia card and you can fill in the card uh, and get a sticker from each of the sponsors. And uh, if you turn it in uh, toward the uh, afternoon at the registration table, then you can get a, an Amazon gift card, I believe in the country of your choice, uh, to, uh, as part of that. So I hope you'll uh, dig in there and take part in that. A little bit about CloudBees. Uh, so we're obviously sponsoring the conference. Uh, we um, have Jenkins at the uh, core of our uh, continuous delivery offering. Uh, whether you're running it on-premise or you're running it hosted in the cloud, we have a fully hosted offering also. Or whether you're kind of mixing those together in a hybrid kind of mode. A lot of people are using Jenkins on-premise and want to use some of the build capacity in the cloud also. CloudBees is uh, there with a solution for, for you in that area. So I hope you will visit us. And we've been doing this for a while. Obviously, uh, Kozuke is a, a key part of our organization, actually our chief technical officer. And uh, we have a lot of people using our stuff, uh, ranges from uh, uh, Six Sigma type of organizations like Netflix to uh, larger enterprises like uh, Intuit and Cisco and, uh, and Alcatel Lucent and so on. So we've, uh, I think, had a lot of success helping people out become uh, successful at using Jenkins at scale and in interesting ways. And one of the things uh, that we are very proud of, I think, as an organization is the way that 
we have worked with the community to advance Jenkins. And uh, so the way that we do this is we are very committed to making sure that Jenkins itself remains the best of breed offering for continuous integration and continuous delivery. Uh, so we are investing in the core of Jenkins and additional capabilities in the open source project. We're very committed to making sure that the community continues to grow and prosper and is engaged because the community is really what has given Jenkins its strength with uh, over 900 plugins available now and so on. So we do a lot of that. Um, on the commercial side, we are support providing support and uh, capabilities to use Jenkins at scale, high availability, security type of extensions and things like this. So this is how we divide this up. And philosophically, we make sure that as we improve Jenkins at its core and make the product, the offering even more uh, strong, that that raises the bar on us and what we need to do to improve it. One way we do that is we're engaged in the community with key plugins. A lot of them I'm sure you are using. We have a few people who contribute to it, including this, this tall Japanese guy here uh, who is uh, holding one of his, uh, his projects I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, here. Um, we have uh, a number of people who regret the outfits that they donned one day and got a picture taken. So uh, Jesse Glick and Steve Christo and uh, Nicola Deleuve uh, and uh, Stephen Connolly and others now contributing to the open source uh, Jenkins project. I'm sure you'll uh, run into a few of them. Uh, the other thing, if you have not done this, uh, it's a really good source of information. There's a newsletter that uh, we gather together and get community content on. About a couple times a year this comes out. It's a good source of information, a good way to stay connected to things that are happening in the community. I definitely encourage you to uh, sign up and, uh, and uh, get a hold of that uh, newsletter for information going on. And here you are at this conference, uh, meeting people and so on. There are other venues for engaging uh, with the community in Jenkins, meetups all over the place. Uh, if you just uh, Google, you can find a local uh, group that uh, wants to talk about Jenkins. It's one of the great things about Jenkins and the project is that people love to share what they're doing on it. It's just uh, a rich source of information in the community. Local meetups are a good way to do that. Uh, most of all, here you are at this conference. I hope you will turn around and meet the person next to you uh, and uh, introduce yourself and tell them what you're doing, what kinds of interesting things you're doing with Jenkins. There'll be, of course, talks about that all day, but you're going to be surrounded by people who have their own experience with it or are struggling with things and would like to know how you are doing different things. So I hope you'll you'll extend your hand to, to your neighbor and... Uh, meet each other and introduce each other and uh, make that happen. So um, I hope that this will be a lot of fun and you'll learn a lot of things. And uh, what I really want to do now is I want to uh, have the honor, I think, of introducing uh, Kosuke. So a little bit about uh, your keynote speaker before he comes up here. So I thought I would share a couple things about him if uh, you do not know this. So uh, one of his, uh, he has a few interesting hobby projects. I've sat uh, across the office from him for several years now. And uh, uh, the uh, Lego globe that you see, his, his wife has made him take it from the house. So the office now is, is uh, being invaded by his uh, hobby projects. So this globe was uh, designed by uh, him based on uh, a bunch of digital data that he, uh, he downloaded. Of course, he wrote a program to explain to himself and, and his daughter, who he, uh, co he co-ops into doing this kind of thing with him, how to build this. The, uh, the source code is available. And this is actually his next project. So uh, he has uh, co-opted a few people in the office to contribute to buying Lego blocks, and they are building uh, a Lego uh, Matterhorn. So that's, that's his next project. And if you're interested in, in that, I'm sure he'd like to talk with you about it. And then this is uh, another one of uh, Kosuke's uh, hobbies also. So, um, and I translated cross-stitch into uh, cross 
Kreuzstück in German because I thought that, you know, even in English, to an English-speaking audience, most of them have no idea what cross-stitch is to begin with. So, so uh, cross-stitch, if you do not know, is, you know, kind of this thing where you, you push threads through and you, you cross them to create new figures and so on, and he designs these and so on. Uh, really, the challenge for him, like uh, any good programmer, he is pretty much obsessed with uh, optimization. So uh, he is definitely, his, he's explained to me that he thinks as he does this, how can he optimize and minimize the use of threads as he builds this? But he's also trying to discover what the algorithm is to minimize thread use. But his biggest problem, frankly, is that he can't find anyone who does cross-stitch, who also does programming like this, who he can talk to about this problem. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, another one of his hobbies. So and his obsession, his absolute obsession, his passion, of course, is Jenkins. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, bring him up here, and you can hear him, uh, him talk about him. Thank you. All right, thank you, Steve. And just for the record, that the thing on the back you saw that is not mine. Like mine would be a whole lot more beautiful, right? So that's the whole point. So that is not mine. Um, so, well, so first of all, um, thank you very much for coming today. I'm really impressed to see this many people, like even people standing in the back. Um, so maybe uh, perhaps a little bit of garbage collection to uh, compact the empty seat in the middle might help having people sit in the room. But I'm, you know, I understand that you're really busy, and uh, so I appreciate your you know, spending your day here with the, the Jenkins community to, um, to have this event. And um, nothing about throwing event is cheap, and you know, as you can see, this is a pretty nice venue. And, and so I also wanted to extend my thank you to the sponsors for making this event possible. Um, um, so, you know, th so go talk to these people so that you know, they feel like they would come back next year and then get the show going again. So Jenkins has been growing quite substantially uh, in recent years. For example, when you look at the usage statistics, you can see that the installation base has grown 30% year over year. And at the same time, the number of slaves that these masters control has grown 43% year over year. And things that the people run on those, so the builds, I mean, the number of jobs that they set up on these instances has grown 67% uh, year over year. So you could say that the, uh, not only the number of people are using, more and more people are using Jenkins, the newer people are coming on board with Jenkins, but also the existing users, it's sort of progressively doing more things. They are expanding the domain of automation by using Jenkins. There's another survey done by a company called uh, Rebel Labs, and they found that the, of, the, um, of the people who are using continuous integration, 70% um, of the people are using uh, Jenkins to do it. So uh, we, you know, it really became effectively the most um, adopted continuous integration server on the market. So perhaps of this reflection, nowadays it's really difficult to go to any technology conferences without seeing the name Jenkins mentioned a few times. If you go to the Amazon's web service conference, you know, the Java one used to be like the biggest tech conference, and now I think this might be the one of the biggest tech conference on earth nowadays. Um, and then if, so if you go there in Las Vegas, you'll hear from the Amazon guys talking about Jenkins in the context of the, uh, the Amazon Ops work. Or if you've been to uh, Google Cloud Platform, uh, Google Platform, Cloud Platform Lab event, I always get confused with this one. But anyway, so the Google is actually, you know, they starting to push Jenkins, and then so you could see that the Jenkins made an appearance in their demo. Um, so the, um, you know, 1,400 people have watched this demo at the same time, um, and then so I was quite thrilled to see that, and then so I took the screenshot, and it's here. And you know, even in the slide deck, they, the, the word Jenkins would appear in the, up there, which is kind of a, really unusual because the Google tends to hide everything they do behind their uh, pretty UI in, the, in, the, the, in their data center. So for the, fa the fact that they did recognize this 
you know, values and ecosystem of the, uh, this project, I thought was amazing. Another rage nowadays is Docker. Uh, there was a DockerCon uh, two weeks ago in San Francisco, and there, there is Mr. Jenkins uh, showing up in their keynote slide, and you know, at the same level as GitHub, which is pretty good. And even we even show up on TV show. Um, there's a, in US, the, uh, there's a TV series called Silicon Valley, which is like an unusual show that tries to describe the life of startup culture in San Francisco. You can sort of, uh, that's sort of the setting. And it's surprisingly accurate in various details. So um, here, the, in one of the episodes, so you, you see that the, in the box there's like an IntelliJ and then all the code that actually makes sense. And then so this is like early in the morning, the guys are really heads down and they got to deliver this uh, software by the morning because the database is otherwise broken and so on. So it's like in the climactic scene, the Jenkins should appear on the screen. And then so you know, they, it is running the test. So the tests are in progress and people are anxiously waiting for this to pass. And like next minute, like all become green, and everyone would high five and head home. And we did that without like paying any money to it. So I thought, you know, this is pretty amazing achievement. Um, I wish I had. Um, may I finally felt like okay, maybe I could finally explain my wife what I do. Um, so the Jenkins community, in a way, is a little bit like a, a grand bazaar. Um, there's a lot of activity going in 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 very, every alley. Um, not all shops are like neatly organized and often in fact it's sort of lots of combination and messy stuff. But that is sort of like, that is sort of what you expect out of the open source community. That it's a sort of a lot of things are happening and the interesting ideas are floated around. People are trying to get something done there. So what I wanted to do today um, is to sort of put some spotlight on some of these efforts that's going in in the community in the hope that you get some sense of what are the kind of things that the, this project is working on nowadays. So um, the first one that I wanted to talk about is the called .ci, and this is done by uh, Groupon, which is, uh, I guess, uh, probably a famous company even in here. So the .ci, is, uh, it's technically implemented as a plugin, but it's actually a very um, Substantial, it adds some substantial flavor to Jenkins to the point that it almost starts to feel like it's a different flavor, different distribution of Jenkins. So the main idea of the .ci is so that it's, it has narrowly scoped focus that, okay, so this is for someone using um, GitHub and Docker. So if you're not fitting in this description, they're not even trying to make it work for you. But by making this assumption, they can make a lot of things simpler for you. So, for example, they all say, okay, you can, for every repository on your GitHub, you can create one Jenkins job, and then that's it. And then so, by making this trade-off, you can instead create new projects very easily, and then uh, you configure the Jenkins job, not by going to the UI, but by adding a file called .ci.yaml file. So this describes how you do the build. And then so therefore, um, that's where the name comes from. There's a lot of Docker integration here. Groupon apparently uh, develops and, and deploy in Docker containers. So uh, if you want the build to run in a specific Docker container, they do that. If you want the build to produce the Docker container, they would also do that automatically and tag that and publish the bits. So you know, this, if that's the kind of workflow, if, that, if that's the kind of model you're heading to, then I think this would be a very interesting software. Um, and then finally, uh, this plugin uses the MongoDB as the backend. So instead of storing XML file, they still use XML file, but instead of storing that on the disk in the file system, it gets stored in the cluster of MongoDB. And they reported that they've been successfully running thousands of projects on this setup, and then uh, the, the use of MongoDB in the backend helps them um, have a better turnaround time uh, when Jenkins has to be cycled. So there's a, so we, like a community was actually quite intrigued with this sort of combination. We are trying to tip some of them off into each separate plugin so that we could use them elsewhere. The, another sort of active conversation going on right now is around the uh, effort called Dooney, or the user interface refresh. So this guy, uh, so there's a guy who works for uh, Twilio uh, called the um, Kevin Bork, I and mean, he did this uh, like a user interface theme called Dooney. And then so um, since this is about the UI, I wanted to see if I could quickly show it. Let's see. 
if this should, oops. Oh, mm, there. Oh, okay. Jeez. Come. Okay, yeah, all right. So, um, so this is just, you know, primarily it's like a custom CSS and JavaScript added around the user interface. And uh, because the screen resolution font size is a bit skewed, it might not be obvious, but um, there's a subtle touch to various parts um, that makes it really sort of look, feel nicer the user experience wise. So um, there's a, the, a couple of people in the community that's talking about um, how to integrate uh, changes like this into a into Jenkins, um, and so in fact, I think the first batch of changes has landed. So there's a big build now button. The console output looks like more like a console. I guess you got rid of most of the icons, um, and then if you do that, um, you'll see that you know, the way this interacts with you is a little bit different. So we are working on. Uh, Trying to switch the screen here. Yeah, so we are working on. Um, yeah, so we are working on bringing some of these changes into the core. So in the in the initial uh, batch of changes, we are bringing in these changes in, and then um, in the next wave of efforts, we are trying to switch the layout from the table, current table layout, finally to the DAV into the 21st century. Um, and then so that would in turn enable us to do more sophisticated folding and some uh, user interface changes, in the, especially in the configuration phase. And we're making you know, the text bigger and the more clickable. The controls are also bigger, uh, the section titles, all sorts of things. And uh, we think we can do this in a way that mostly preserves the backward comp compatibility so that the plugins won't be impacted by this change. And um, if, again, if this round of change is successful, uh, there's a lot of other additional things being uh, discussed right now. So I think the one of the key idea, um, which also was the part of the conversation from the last FOSDEM meetup, this is the sort of where the number of Jenkins developers meet and talk about various issues. And this was discussed as a one of the topic, which is to be able to update the content of the page after it loads. So if you're looking at the, the list of jobs, like at the top page of the Jenkins, then you'd like to see as the build happens, they update by themselves. So that's the kind of thing we are aiming for. Um, and then furthermore, there's more user experience really discussions like allowing you to create more repository from source trees like um, you know, the dep existing repositories like GitHub and uh, Bitbucket and so on. Perhaps we need some ways to help people discover more plugins by using uh, something like plugin pack. Um, so these things hopefully would come in, du in due time. And as a part of this exercise, so one of the things that we are thinking about is uh, bumping up the minimum requirement of the Jenkins core from current subnet 2.5 to subnet 3.0. Um, and when we look at the usage statistics, it seems like about 3% uh, of the user base are running Tomcat 6, which we will not implement subnet 3.0. Um, so, so far when we are asking, when we ask the community, like, does this upgrade cause a problem for people, they seem to be uh, mostly positive. But if you are uh, one of the people who have ar good arguments against us bumping up this requirement, then we'd love to hear soon. Uh, because otherwise, I think this is going to happen sooner or later. Because uh, it's pretty much necessary for us to do any uh, asynchronous content update. All right. So another effort that's going on in the community that I wanted to highlight a little bit is sort of this idea of end-to-end -end artifact tracking by using fingerprints. So fingerprint is actually one of the relatively hidden feature in Jenkins. You might not be using it, but the idea is, okay, so you have a file that Jenkins tends to produce, and then um, Jenkins will remember it's MD5 checksum, and we call it fingerprints because every artifact that's produced from Jenkins tends to have a unique checksum. 
So it turns out that the you know people are using more and more configuration management tools like Chef and Puppet, and these two also track these various artifacts by using checksums. So the idea is okay. So on the one side of the house, the developers are using Jenkins to produce builds and running the tests, but on the other side of the house, the operation team is using the configuration management to deploy. So are there anything we can do to sort of connect these two worlds to do better? Um, and so what we are doing in this effort is, okay, so in this kind of house, you have the source code um, that's getting compiled into some kind of binary file by using Jenkins. So if you're using Java, maybe the artifact might be WAR file, perhaps those are RPM package, or it might be a Ruby gem. Whatever, it doesn't matter, but it tends to be that these artifacts that's produced by Jenkins would leave uh, Jenkins after they are produced. So you might be using... Um, a binary artifact manager like um, Artifactory or Nexus. It might be just a, like an APT or Debian repository um, and so on. And then the, it, at some later point in time, generally outside the control of Jenkins, this chef or puppet would run and they would download these files, maybe from S3, maybe from Artifactory, into the target server. So what we do is we put a little custom reporter inside this chef and puppet process. So, and then when they lay down the file from somewhere into the file system, we would track its uh, fingerprints, its checksum, and then have it sent back to Jenkins. So in this way, Jenkins would learn that, okay, the file that like, we produced in the build 150 is now deployed on this server in the production environment or staging environment. And then so you can use that to cause a um, lot of additional actions. So this provides you know, the, the incredible fidelity into how, uh, where are the bits are deployed when. And then so by using that, you could sort of trigger other activities that causes more automation. So you could, for example, run the uh, battery of smoke test after the files are deployed to, say, staging servers. Or um, you could use the promotion plugin so that you have the uh, build status would show that the, uh, the particular build is now deployed in certain environment. And the reason I did this with both Chef and Puppet is because um, we wanted to, the foundation of this is tool independent. So any kind of configuration management tool you're using, you could hook into this scheme and make it work. Now, in case of Chef, uh, this is done as a custom report handler, as I said. So it's like a, maybe you have to add four or five lines of additional Chef recipe. In case of Puppet, it turns out that the the built-in default reporter they have is sufficient for this purpose. So all you have to do is really just add a few command line options to uh, puppet, land, puppet invocation or um, just grab the report file that they produce and then send it back to Jenkins. So um, this effort also came from the one of the post conversation at the post them. And I think it's actually at the point where people could, should be able to start using it. So um, now the, I'd love to hear from more people using this. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing. All right, so the, another area of lots of, yeah, another pocket of activities in the Jenkins community is around the Jenkins and Docker. Um, so the, I already talked about .ci, which is you know, the, uh, the group on thing that comes with certain preconceived notion about how things should be done. But if you are using Docker in other contexts, um, there's a number of more general purpose plugin that integrates doc Docker with what Jenkins. So what the first one that I wanted to talk about is this uh, Docker plugin for Jenkins. This is done by Nigel Magni. Uh, he tends to produce lots of interesting plugins, and uh, this one is no exception. So what this does is, um, OK, the idea here is, OK, you want to use the Docker container as an one of slave that you could throw away at the end of the build. So you can guarantee that you have just the right environment, the, the same environment as the actual runtime environment. Um, and then so you can run the build inside, and then it will throw it away uh, at the end of the build. There's another plugin that the, um, the Michael O'Neill uh, did. He's, well, he's one of my colleagues. And uh, so this, so what, what, his, what he did was, okay, if you're building a Docker container as a part of the build process, then Jenkins should be able to make it easy to tag the build and then push the result into the remote repository. So that's what this plugin does. And both are sort of really useful when you're uh, starting to use Docker um, for just about any circumstances. But um, so of all these efforts, um, uh, the, 
the one that I'm personally spending the most time on, and I think the one that I think perhaps because of that is most significant, is the workflow. So, um, so this we are adding um, uh, actually. So the so people are doing the sort of increasingly more complex automation on top of Jenkins, as we saw in the statistics, statistics earlier. And then so, you know, it's not so uncommon to see people build, uh, quote unquote, continuous delivery pipeline, or something like this. You know, it would start by building some, uh, the building a piece of software, and then it exposes that through the progressive uh, progressively expensive testing. So you might start with some uh, simple functional testing, but um, you know if that's all successful, you'd want to run more expensive integration and regression testing. And perhaps at that end of it, the bits are declared as release ready. Um, and then if the stakeholders should approve of the actual deployment, then the bits would then hit the actual production server. So if you think about setting this kind of things on Jenkins, which I think the many people do today. And um, I, think I'm, I think I'm getting excited here. So let's, <laughs> let's take this off. Um, so I think the standard way of doing this, so it's great that you can do this kind of things today in Jenkins. Uh, on the other hand, the way people do this tend to end up with something like this, where you have like a, you know, the, each of the step, each of these boxes defined as a separate Jenkins job. And then you would use a combination of a number of plugins to basically hook them up into the right way so that they, at the end of the day, this would like, you know, do the right thing. Um, so the, when you do something like this, um, it feels a little bit like this, like a Lego assembly the process. It feels like, OK, so we have all these building blocks, pieces called plugins. You can even make some if you want to. But you kind of still have to combine them into the right way to make things happen. Um, and then so if all you're trying to do is to just get the tractor, the fact that you have to assemble this is a bit of pain. Even though for some people, the fact that you could assemble just about anything is a great attraction. And you know, it is honestly a strong value of the Jenkins. So recognizing this problem, okay, so we started thinking about how we can make this kind of large-scale automation really simple and more flexible. So that's, um, that we've started talk really seriously talking about that in the uh, Scalability Summit uh, in San Francisco the last year. And then we finally started implementing it. And we know we are happy to announce that it, the first version of it has been released. Uh, so the, really the key value here is that in workflow, in this brand new job type called workflow, you can define something like what you just saw in just one job. And then this is, you do not need anything else. This is the only thing you need to get that whole thing implemented. So it'd be a lot simpler in terms of deploying something like this across many different product lines you might have, or you can uh, make uh, the changes to these complex workflows. The, another key sort of design choice is that the, is the workflow is written in text. Um, and then so it's, in fact, it's written as a program that executes from top to bottom. And then this is basically you know, the idea that's proven successful by the earlier effort called Build Flow Plugin, which is done by Nicola, which is another colleague of ours. And um, you know, as you can see, well, I don't want you to read too much into it, but the key idea here is in Build Flow, well, all right, all you can do is to call into other jobs. But here, you're actually doing all sorts of things, like checking out from the Git repository or executing Maven and so on. It's entirely inside a single uh, script. So this is why you get to define the whole complex workflow in just a single file instead of you know, a dozen different jobs. And since this is such a substantial new system, we are actually using this opportunity to fix a number of other long-standing pain points in Jenkins. Um, so one of those is that the, you know, now that we are talking about this, like a long, uh, the, um, yeah, the long-running workflow, the long-running continuous delivery pipeline, the whole execution could take like you know the hours to days in various places. Uh, one of the pain that you probably know is that the, if the Jenkins would go down, or if the slave would go down while the build is in progress, the Jenkins would forget the context, and then you know, the build would be marked as a failure, so you'd have to redo everything from scratch again. So this would make it kind of painful to upgrade the plugins and then you know, have it get restarted, because you have to wait at the right moment to, to make it happen. So you know, this is no longer the case with workflow. Um, 
while the workflow is in operation, so for example, like once you start running Maven, you could shut down the entire Jenkins instance and bring it back up, and then it will remember still what it was doing, and it can be connected. Or if you temporarily lose the network connectivity with a slave, you know, there has been some bugs that affected that area, um, and then the Jenkins will be able to relaunch the new slave process, and then that slave process will be able to go find out what kind of build you are running on that node, and then reconnect the right context. So you could shut this down any time you need. So um, the workflow, you know, could, could consist of any number of these, like some linear steps, some parallel steps, or loops, or lots of these complicated control flows. So what often did, what we discovered after we talked to people doing the, uh, the this kind of sophisticated uh, the continuous release and so on, is that the, these processes each tends to take some you know, considerable amount of time to run. So let's say um, we start running this guy, and you know, like it turns uh, blue one by one. But the, another challenge in this kind of environment is that the, not all of these steps are as reliable as you want it to be. So sometimes, for random reasons, let's say perhaps because the server was down or the disk was full, you, know, you can end up having one of the steps fail. And then as a guy who runs Jenkins release every week, I can tell you that you know, the Jenkins release process is a little bit like that. I have to produce packages like in the Windows and log into OSX and produce another native package there and so on. So it happens, it, that, it just, you, know, you can't just eliminate this possibility that something would go wrong somewhere. So what you don't want to do is that the, to go all the way back from the beginning and then do everything from scratch again because you've just wasted like a whole, whole so many hours of effort that was perfectly fine just because this one step was a failure. Um, and then I, we discovered that the two avoid this, people are sort of tweaking their work so it is substantially to the point that like it looks, it starts to look like a spaghetti. Um, so in Jenkins workflow, uh, what we are adding is called checkpoint. So the checkpoint allows you to say, all right, so you know, remember the state of the workflow at this point, and then when the failure happens, instead of going all the way back to the beginning, you can just go away, go, the, go back to the arbitrary checkpoint that you want it to be run from, and then you start execu resume execution from that point, and the workflow would then run to the completion uh, successfully. So you get to save a, a lot of time before uh, when you are having this kind of complex workflow, and you don't really have to complicate your script unnecessarily to accommodate this kind of use case. So as you can hopefully see, what we are trying to build is instead of asking you to combine all these individual pieces in the right way, this is really just meant to be one plugin that can that that can that allows you to design just about any workflow, any sort of continuous delivery pipeline possible. So um, it's meant to be like a one plugin to rule them all. Um, and then so you know, we are very excited that so far the reaction we are getting for this effort is very positive, and I hope uh, you will have a chance to try it out. So. Um, I'll be talking more about uh, this workflow effort in the another talk that we have later today in the uh, that Hapreet and I are doing. But if you won't be able to get there, um, so this plugin is all open source except the, uh, the I guess the checkpoint part, which is I think the something is going to be a part of the Jenkins Enterprise by CloudBees. Um, but the foundation is all open source, and it's really at the point that's ready for other plugin developers to look at and build the primitives on top of it. So as you expect from everything that we do in Jenkins project, this is a, a F, this is an effort that's full of the extension points that allows other people to build on top, and you know that's one of the reasons this is done being this is being done in open source. So um, yes, yeah, so go please go check that out and tell us what you think. All right, so that's about the workflow and then quick time check. Um, so the next area of the effort that really saw a lot of activity is around the quality improvement or the testing uh, of Jenkins itself. So as I lead into that, the first thing I wanted to touch on is the change of the release model in the LTS release. So for those of you who have, who have been hiding under the rock, the LTS release is it's sort of like a, you can think of it as a sustaining release of Jenkins. So every three months, uh, we pick up one release from the main line that looks like I have a very positive review, and then for the duration of a uh, 12 weeks, 
uh, we produce uh, three sustaining releases, like you know, dot one and dot two and dot three. So you get a longer sort of, you know, the less bug fix only sustaining branches out of the main releases. So if you if you don't if you are not so keen on getting the latest and greatest releases, but rather want stability, this is a good option for you. So it used to be that, that we've been producing this, we've been shipping these uh, LTS releases whenever we are ready. But we've been doing this for perhaps like a year and a bit longer now. So um, we got used to this enough that, okay, we started feeling like we could actually commit to a certain time. And it makes it easier to do various things, among which is it makes it easier for us to involve the user community in this effort. So part of the reason um, the LTS is used is because um, the large-scale users tend to have to do some kind of pre-upgrade testing on their site to make sure that it works with their set of plugins and on their environment. So when they are planning ahead this kind of upgrade, we'd love to have that schedule coordinated with the uh, upstream community LTS release schedule. Because if we are finding bugs, then we'd like to know that so that before we ship LTS, we can integrate fixes to those problems. So um, by having a predictable plan, and you can come to the Jenkins project event calendar and then see this. Uh, if you come to it there, then you can sort of see when we are releasing what, so you can plan ahead your schedule accordingly. And then so that allows more people to contribute to the LTS qualification process. And uh, as a, in fact, this is already taking effect now. The last LTS we did this had the biggest number of the people from the community contributing to the effort. And we'd like to see more of that. And then, so in relation to this LTS effort, um, what we are really ramping up on is what we call as this acceptance test and acceptance test harness. So it, it turns out that this is a somewhat old project that's initiated by Tyler, uh, who mainly handles infrastructure. Um, and, but the, uh, earlier this year, the Vivek and I had rewritten, uh, they po basically ported this test suite, originally that written in Ruby into Java, and that made it easier for a number of people to contribute. Um, and then nowadays, we are seeing very active in engagement in this project. In fact, many of them from Germany. Um, we see on average more than 50 commits in this repository per week, and uh, done by so far 22 people and counting. And it covers major uh, plugins, like uh, 50 odd plugins are currently tested in this test, and then um, together they produce about 350 to 60 tests. So, and then, so we are starting to use this as a release criteria to make sure that there's no regression in the core, well, to make sure that the change in the core isn't causing regression in the plugin, that sort of things. So the reason it's called acceptance test, and the way it works, is basically it's a black box testing. So um, the test would launch Jenkins in somewhere, in some manner, um, and then usually with a set of plugins. So you should mentally picture, okay, so we are launching Jenkins in the exact same environment, same environment as yours, in the exact same set of plugins that you use. And then the test would use Selenium to interact with Jenkins in much the same way that you do through the browser. Um, and then it makes sure that the right things happen at the end of it. So by you know, using this kind of mechanism to test, we hope to find the uh, browser-specific problems. So in the past, we had a no number of issues with the Internet Explorer in particular. So you got to have to get our act together there. Uh, some of the uh, web container behaves differently. So the Tomcat and the Glassfish are very different implementations. So some aspects of that is different. Um, we can test the operating, spec operating system specific issues. Jenkins has some native components. So we want to make sure that, let's say, the Jenkins would run OK on previously. So doing that kind of thing requires this kind of harness, not the current unit test harness. Uh, but, but perhaps more importantly for you, Again, this, with this kind of test, we can discover so that the issue that arises from a specific combination of plugins and cores and so on. So it is this uh, harness would provide a greater control into how you run tests. So not, not only can you specify, all right, this is the version of Jenkins I want to test on this environment, on this operating system with this container, but I want them with these plugins and so on. So that flexibility would provide you to really allow you to run the right kind of testing. And because of that, I think the reason I'm spending this time, this much time to talk about this is this should be not only interesting to the developers of the Jenkins project, but it should be also interesting to the users of the project because it really allows you to test your environment um, and then 
Uh, so, you know, we've been build, writing all these tests and you could actually use them. Or um, you could write the tests. If you write your test, you know, I know that the number of large users have, as I mentioned, go through the extensive set of testing before they deploy a new version of Jenkins in their production environment. So if you're doing that, I'd love to see that written in the same test furnace. And then that allows you to share your test cases with the rest of the community. So now we, the project, could be made responsible for running these tests and to make sure that your test is covered before we release the new version of Jenkins. And I think that's really useful for a many number of reasons. And um, there's a, I think there's a lot of interesting activities going on here. And because we want to test so many different aspects of Jenkins, uh, what we are trying to do here is to a, create a separately reusable pieces inside the test so, um, for example, we have a part that's involved about how to launch Jenkins, you know, whether that's on JBoss or whether that's inside the Vagrant with uh, Winston or whatever it is. Or, so, and then there's a separate uh, you know, sub-module that implements all kinds of page objects for Selenium. But if you're, let's say, if you're trying to do the scalability testing, um, maybe, the, maybe you're not really so much interested in so bombarding Jenkins through the page object. So you can you can choose not to use some of these pieces, but select the other parts. Like say, you know, the aforementioned um, the scalability test. You might not care about the page object, but you might still find this Docker integration useful, which allows us to run a real server. So we can launch a uh, Git behind the uh, HTTPS, or we can launch the open LDAP server with the right data set so that we can test the real uh, the LDAP integration, that kind of things. Um, so all these, there's lots of pieces like that that allows us to um, run and develop this harness into many different ways. So I'm really looking forward to see more people sort of hop on this bandwagon to get uh, so that uh, we could improve the quality of Jenkins. Um, so this effort has come quite far. Um, the, so as I mentioned, there was more than 300 tests in there, which is pretty good. That's covering from, you know, the Jira integration to LDAP plugin, even to Active Directory integration to somewhat. Um, but we still got a lot more work to do here. So the one is that we want to be running this test more often. Um, and a part of it, because it can run in so many different environments, we want to get more coverage, uh, but which means more machines um, and then the platforms. So we are still working on that. Um, some of these changes, because of the nature of the technology involved, it's not as stable as we'd like it to be. So we want to make sure that these are flaky tests are all discovered and fixed and so on. So that work is still in progress. And then finally, as I mentioned, so far we've been focusing on functional tests, but we want to take this to the non-functional tests, like scalability tests, load tests, that kind of thing, uh, so that we can make sure that the Jenkins is behave correctly, even if it's running for a long time or under heavy load. And on that note about heavy load, that is actually one of the focus in Jenkins. So we internally coined this term called X1K for uh, 1,000 executors. So the idea is that today there are several outlier installations that runs thousands of executors under a single Jenkins instance. And these people aren't having as smooth a life as you know, we'd like them to have. You know, it's a lot easier to manage a 50 slave instance as opposed to 1,000 slave instance. So we started asking ourselves, OK, so what does it really take to, um, to, get the, uh, to be able to comfortably recommend that, OK, you can put 1,000 slaves, 1,000 executors under a single Jenkins instance? And then, so that'd be a good answer for the scalability, right? So there has been lots of effort in the past year or so that's like a progress we identifying one problem at a time and fixing them. So the recent round of changes in this space involves using more NIO in remoting. So this is the technology we use for the master-slave communications. So it used to be that uh, we had to have hundreds of slave, uh, hundreds of threads to manage hundreds of slave, uh, sorry, let me try this again. So hundreds of threads was necessary to manage hundreds of slaves. But uh, now with thanks to NIO, we, can only, we only need a fixed number of, like a handful of threads, and they can manage a large number of the uh, Jenkins slaves quite comfortably. So it's been deployed to JNLP, um, and then, um, the, uh, nowadays, so if this is so, this has been so far, I think, been successful. So we are now trying to bring them back into the 
uh, CLI, uh, which uses the same mechanism. And in relation to this effort, we've really improved the performance of the uh, Maven 2 job types. Uh, one of the uh, larger, larger users of Jenkins in the Bay Area had hit this issue, and I had a chance to really look into their instance and understand where the time was spent. So um, we were able to sort of improve the artifact archiving performance of the Maven job types quite substantially. Uh, and then, uh, so if you're using this, then I think I recommend you to upgrade to a recent release that fixes this problem because it makes a tremendous difference. Another area of the, um, the JMP slave improvements is around the stability. So, um, you know, we had a number of reports around the Java web start slave, like not as stable as it should be. And we are still really trying to understand what's going on there. But the one of the issue is that the, these slaves, once they get launched, they tend to live a long time. And then in the meantime, if it loses a connection with the master, the VM would still stick around, trying to reconnect back to the master, and it, you know, re-establish the connection, get some work done, and so whatever reason, the, if it lost the connection, maybe a Jenkins master has been distorted, it will try to reconnect back, and then it will find it again, and so on and so forth. So you know, it could be that the, the, the slave process could live on like weeks to months. And then so as is the case with any long-running processes, when you do this kind of thing, um, it tends to sort of clog up some dust inside the, um, the garbage inside the uh, heap. You know, maybe it starts to leak something, and eventually we think that's what's choking the slave process. So in recent release, what we started doing is um, if we detect that the slave has lost the communication with the master, we want to just go ahead and restart the slave automatically. So every time everyone's saying, wow, if it loses communication, it comes back into the clean state. And so we expect that this will really uh, substantially prolong the life of the slaves. And so this works automatically for every Unix slaves. And for Windows, if you have installed this slave as a service, then the Jenkins slave would talk to the service controller and get this thing automatically restored. OK, so the next one, what I wanted to cover is the Jenkins infra. Um, so the title had uh, the recently initiated this effort where, OK, so let's, we should be eating more of our dog food. You know, clearly, more people are interested in building the deployment pipeline. And then so you know, using something like Jenkins and, or Puppet or Chef or the Docker. So we should be doing the same to manage our own infrastructure. Not only does it help to keep our infrastructure in a good shape, but it also actually allows us to learn what kind of challenges people have and hope to improve Jenkins to make it better. So um, the Tyler has managed to talk to Puppet Labs, who graciously gave us some uh, the, uh, the uh, consulting resources that helps us get going with this effort. Um, and then so now it's up and running now. So we have a sort of like a continuous stability pipeline that goes from the source code to the Docker container to the Puppet, um, and then in a way that's all nicely tested. So uh, the good thing about this effort is that the, um, you know, it's as uh, the as an open source project, we can make the, all this thing available and visible to you. So if you're interested in putting together this kind of pieces into the coherent continuous stability pipeline, I think you'd benefit from looking at our repository. So this defines like uh, our branching strategies, how we accept the pull request. You know, whenever a new pull request arrives, we run this battery of tests automatically on Jenkins. And then so that kind of workflow is something you're, you should be interested in. And then you can look at our effort, and you can even copy that and then start uh, from there. And I think this is also another good way to join the, um, join our, um, the Jenkins project. You know, so not everything in Jenkins is about write, writing plugins or uh, writing um, Java code. So this is actually pretty, I think, cutting edge stuff that has a lot of demand in various places. So the good thing about this is like, okay, if you work on something like this, then you can point your future employers, at, by, by the way, this is what I've done in the, uh, in the context of uh, the, the Puppet and Docker and uh, continuous in, in deployment. And then I think a lot of people will find that quite convincing. And that's, 
like how I tend to like to find new jobs. Like okay, so when I when the when I wasn't when I stopped working for Oracle, by the way, like I got this open source project and people seem to like it. Like are you? I think I'm useful for you. And that's how you can find uh, new. You know, I think as an engineer, that's how you could sort of step up your career. So um, if this is the kind of thing that's your passion, then I really love to see you join the effort. There's like a, one or two guys that's already into this effort, when, and uh, we'd love to see more of you in there. So to wrap things up, um, the, there's a lot of things going on in the project as I was hopefully able to show you. And these are just like a few of the ice, well, few of the tips of the icebergs that I'm aware of. And the, nowadays the Jenkins ecosystem is just so large and I don't need to even know, claim to know everything that's going on in there. Um, and then the, the great thing about the open source project is that the, there's an opportunity to, for everyone to do, do anything that they want to do. And so still, we, as, a, as a community, as a together, sort of, there's, it's like a great joy in being able to, this, being, a, being a part of this bazaar, this vibrant place that things are happening. And uh, there's also a unique joy as a, as a sort of techie to be able to see other techies that really use your stuff and appreciate what you've done, which is sometimes difficult to get when you're working in a large environment. So I really wanted to sort of encourage more people to join us in the community because you know, this is a community effort, this is a joint effort, and we really want to build this together. So uh, today you'll hear from many other people in the community that's doing just that. So you know, get, inspired, get inspired by talking to these people and looking forward to work with you. Uh, in the community in coming days. Thank you very much.